Good morning. I hope you're all awake because I'm going to take you on a trip to the zoo. It's a zoo with monkeys, rhinoceroses, and an aquarium. More specifically, it's spider monkeys, German rhinoceroses, aka Nashorn, and squirrelfish. You probably guessed it, I'm talking about JavaScript engines. So JavaScript has gotten incredibly fast, and we'll look at how the engines work under the hood and the optimization techniques. I'll also show you a few code examples, how you can work, how you can take advantage of these optimizations rather than working against the engine. And just to clarify, I won't focus on the differences between the different engines. Instead, I'll talk about what they have in common. So the optimization examples that I'll show you will work independently of your browser choice. Okay, 1995, cute spider monkey came along. That was the very first JavaScript engine. Back then it was a Netscape communicator, and it's the JavaScript engine after several rewrites that we're using in Firefox today. Of course, Spider Monkey comes with his monkey friends. This Trace Monkey, Jaeger Monkey, Iron Monkey, and Yoden Monkey. Odin Monkey. They help Spider Monkey to speed things up. So in Safari, we have Squirrelfish. The marketing name for JavaScript Core was first written in 2002. And we have a Nashorn. Nashorn is the German name for rhinoceros, so we'll play on Reno. And it's an Oracle's JavaScript engine implemented in Java, and it runs on the JVM. Now, onto the next animal, I mean engine. There's, of course, V8. It's the JavaScript engine in Chrome and the one we use for Node.js. It came out in 2009. And Microsoft's Jcrypt, also known as Chakra, one of the earlier ones written in 1996. It's what we have in Internet Explorer. So. That's already the end of our trip to the zoo. Actually, the animals were just a trick to lure you in here. So now that I have you here, let's move on to something more serious. Let's look at the technical details. I already mentioned that those engines have been rewritten several times, and that's because we wanted better performance. We want fast JavaScript. So there's been, over the last 20 years, a lot of effort been put into making the engines faster. And here are a few benchmarks. Those are several browsers, um, just what I could find. And I've plotted it over the last 10 years on the SunSpider benchmarks. And you can see the score got higher and higher and higher as time moved on, which means we got faster and faster and faster. So are we fast yet? Well, there's a website, arewefastyet.com, talking exactly about that. Um, here's another benchmark score. It's comparing different versions of Firefox versus Chrome. And again, you can see from 2012 to 14, we increased in speed. OK, so that's great. We are faster. Well, we are faster than ourselves before. So does that mean we're actually fast? We are faster than before. What should we compare ourselves to make sure that we're really fast and not just still very slow because we started out slow? Well, let's compare to something that is fast. Let's have a race between C++ and JavaScript and see who wins. So the containers are C++ and JavaScript, and the racetrack are prime numbers. So I want to calculate the first 25,000 prime numbers and see how fast we are compared to fast native C++ code. Just to give you an idea of the code, don't worry, you don't need to read through this. I just want to show you on the left side C++, on the right side JavaScript. It's a fairly simple algorithm, and they look pretty much the same on both sides. So let the race begin. C++. I compile it, and then I run it, and I print out the 25,000 prime number, just to make sure I'm actually computing the right thing. And it took me a little bit over six seconds, 6.2 seconds. So how is JavaScript doing on this? 6.7 seconds. I think that's amazing. That's almost the same time. Um, if you do the math, JavaScript is less than 14% slower than C++. 
And I mean, this is amazing because C++ is a statically typed language. So you have a lot of information before you run your code. And you comp can, when you compile it ahead of time, the compiler can rely on all this information to generate really great code that's running super fast. Whereas in JavaScript, it's dynamically typed. When you are not running it, you have no idea what kind of objects you'll get. So if you generate any machine code up front, you can't optimize that machine code. Um, so the fact that we are almost as fast as native C++, I think that's really amazing. Uh, I just want to point out, I did compile this with the optimization on for C++, so I'm not cheating here comparing to a slow version or anything. Um, if you forget to optimize when compiling, JavaScript would be way faster than the C++ version. All right, so this is great. We're almost as fast as native code, and we'll go through a few of the steps that the engines use to give us this performance. So here's your classical compiler, usually contains those four components. There's a lexa, the lexa takes your source code and converts it to tokens. And then the parser takes the tokens and generates an abstract syntax, syntax tree. And then the abstract syntax tree is translated into bytecode, and then the bytecode is interpreted. And for the interpreter, there is two kinds of compilers. You can compile ahead of time or just in time. So when you compile ahead of time, you compile everything before you run your code. So obviously this is what you do in C++ because it's two separate steps, compiling and then executing your executable. And in C++, compiling ahead of time works well because we have all the type information up front so we can generate optimized machine code that then executes really fast. In JavaScript, this would not work well. A, we don't have a lot of information to generate good code, but also if you load a website, you don't want to wait for all the JavaScript code to be compiled before anything starts running. So instead, for JavaScript, we use a just-in-time compiler. So as we want to run it, we compile it, and this is also sometimes called lazy compilation, because we're not doing all the work up front. We compile as we go. But if we do it naively, this sadly is very slow. So this is your JavaScript 20 years ago. Yes, it compiles as you go, but it's slow. So how do we go from the sleepy just-in-time compiler to this almost native speed? Okay. So our JavaScript engine, the interpreter, is a just-in-time compiler. And what just-in-time compilers in JavaScript rely on heavily to get us any kind of speed are hidden classes or type inference. So let me explain what that is. Um, you know that we don't have classes in JavaScript, at least not until ECMAScript 2.15. But the compiler behind the scenes is assigning a class or a type to every object it encounters. And if two objects are similar in a certain way, then they can have the same hidden class. So then the compiler knows that it can use the same machine code for two objects that are of the same class. So here I have a constructor function for a point. Point takes two arguments and assigns them to x and y. So when I instantiate a new point, the compiler is creating a point object of class pointer, and it assigns it a hidden class, let's say z0. So our point object has a hidden class z0. Now as we work our way through the constructor function, we are now assigning we're now setting the member variable x. What the compiler is doing is saying, well, this hidden class c0, if I add a member variable x to it, I get a new hidden class, a hidden class c1, where at offset 0, I have the value of x. And it knows now that the point object should, point, should be of type class 1 and not z0. So as we do the same thing for y, the compiler is again saying, well, if I take a c1 class, and I add a member variable y to it, then I get a new hidden class that has at offset 0x at offset 1y. And I get to it by starting with c0, then adding an x, and then adding a y. And so our point object, of course, has 
hidden class C2. It is of this type that's constructed by initializing a point and then setting x and y in this order. So if we now instantiate another point, the compiler will realize that it has the same hidden class as the other point. So two objects behind the scenes have the same hidden class. If I were to add another member variable, say z to a, of course the compiler would go down further and assign a hidden class c3 and so on, and then a and b would not have the same hidden class anymore. And because we're doing this in this order, the order is important. So if you change the order when you assign member variables, you'll also get different hidden classes. If this sounds complicated, um, there's a neat way to check. So I'm using D8 here, that's the debugging shell for V8. And if you pass in the flag allow native syntax, that you can always check if two elements have the same map. So I have two objects, A and B, and for both of them I set X and Y, and then of course they have the same map, the same hidden class. Now if I add another member variable, a dot z equals one, then they don't have the same hidden class anymore. So this is neat because you can, when you're not quite sure if things really are the same, you can check this way. Okay. So, um, when you want to instantiate objects, you can do either this, you can do everything in the constructor function, or you can create an object and then set the objects dynamically. But because it's important for the compiler to know when two things have the same hidden class, it's recommended that you always initialize object members in the constructor functions. So this helps you to make sure that um, objects of the same type actually have the same hidden class. Okay, let's look at arrays. So if we instantiate an array, then the compiler is assigning to it the hidden class of an array of integers. Your compiler is optimistic. It's going to assume, unless it has other information, that it gets the easiest type to work with from you. So an array of integers is fastest to work with, and since we don't have information here, the compiler optimistically assumes it's an array of integers. Now when you push five in it, in fact an integer, the compiler allocates space and puts five in the first position. So, but if you now put in 2.7, a double, it's not an integer anymore. We can't put it in our array of integers. So what the compiler is doing instead is it's assigning the hidden type array of doubles. It knows everything in there is a double, and it's converting the integers that are already in there into doubles and puts them into the array. So now we have an array of doubles with 5.0 and 2.7. So, but now we go along and we push true into it. That's not an integer or a double. So, poor compiler has to start over again, assign the hidden type array, neither integer nor double. Uh, put the 5 in again, the 2.7, or rather the 2.7 is a pointer to the double 2.7 and true. So, by doing this iteratively, we made, the we made the compiler switch three times what the hidden class is and reconvert and reallocate space all over again. So a better way to do is, if you have to mix like this, is use array literals. Do this in one line because then the compiler will start with the, the third kind of array right away instead of redoing work all the time. Okay. So for arrays, initialize using array literals. It's even better if you don't mix numbers and objects because arrays of numbers are faster than those of objects, so when you mix it, you lose the speed and do not cause reconversion. All right, so compiler is doing all this extra work to add hidden classes or type inference to every object it has. How does that give us speak? So far it's only more work. Well, the hidden classes come in in what's called inline caches, ICs. So what's happening here is we cache the machine code for a function's most common hidden class. So what that means is we have a function do something and we call it on A. So in this case, we generate machine code for do something when it's called with something of hidden class A and we save this machine code. Now when we call do something again, 
we don't have to start all over again. Instead, we can check if A and B are similar, if they have the same hidden class. And if they do, we can use this machine code that we've already generated. And only if B is different, well, then we have to start over, do the work, compile, do something for now for Bs, and then we can calculate that. Okay, so for hidden classes, sorry, for inline caches, hidden classes are important. And they speed stuff up because we can reuse the same machine code. Let's look at by how much this is getting faster. So here's an example. I have a function twice, it takes an argument a and it returns a plus a. So when you call twice on an integer, you get twice the integer back. When you call it on a string, you get the string concatenated with itself back. Okay, and I'm calling this a million times randomly either on the string a or four. So every other time I get a a or eight as my answer. Now, here's the same example written slightly different. I have two functions now, twice string and twice int, and they do exactly the same thing as the function before. They return a plus a. But the intention that I'm trying to reveal with the name here is that twice string is only called on strings, twice int is only called on integers. So again, I'm calling this a million times, and I randomly call twice string on a, or I call twice int on four. Now let's look at how those compare in speed. Because in the first example, I keep switching the hidden classes, and I can't cache that function and reuse it. In the second one, the function are always called with the same hidden class. Okay, so here's the first example where I keep switching. Six seconds for a million times. Here's the second one, well, and I'm down to five seconds. So that's 15, 20% better. And I'm doing the same thing. I didn't change the algorithm or compute it less often or anything. I'm just slightly differently formulating my functions. Um, in the first example where we have one function that takes arguments of different shapes, that's called a polymorphic function, poly for many shapes. Whereas in the second example, we had two separate functions that were always only taking integers or strings. Those are called monomorphic functions. So as takeaway, monomorphic functions are better because they are faster than polymorphic functions. Okay, little disclaimer. Premature optimization is the root of all evil. Donald Knuth already wrote that in his paper in 1974. And I'm sure you all know it, I just want to make sure I point it out. So I'm talking here about optimization at the engine level. Um, yes, I got a second faster, but I was running this a million times. So as always, when you optimize, make sure you understand your application, you profile it, and you optimize the right thing. Like, please don't go back and change in your code bases everything to monomorphic functions. You probably won't see any speed up overall of your application. You might only introduce bugs because of typos and so on. So keep in mind what we do here, yes, the optimizations, but don't just blindly apply them. Okay, so our JavaScript engine now. It's Alexa, gives us tokens, parser, converts it to the abstract syntax tree, then we translate that into bytecode, and then we have a just-in-time compiler with hidden classes and inline caches. So it's a little faster, we just saw five instead of six seconds, but that's not anywhere near native C++ code. So instead, this is the secret, or it's not a secret, this is what all modern JavaScript engines have. They have two just-in-time compilers. They have a regular one for everything, and then they have an optimized just-in-time compiler. So this optimized just-in-time compiler, um, it works on every function that is hot. So anything that's called a lot of times is being passed on to the optimized just-in-time compiler. And then this compiler will compile it into machine code, but an optimized machine code. So that's a little more work, that's why we cannot compile everything with the optimized compiler, just the things that are executed a lot of times. Okay, so, but you see this, this arrow going backwards again. When is this happening? Well, this happens when we have a function, 
and it's run a lot and we optimize it and we keep calling it on the optimized code, but all of a sudden we call it with a parameter that has a different hidden class. Now we cannot use the same machine code that we generated if it has a different hidden class. Instead, we bail out, we fall back on the regular compiler and recompile that code to the slower machine code, but for this other hidden class. Okay, so um, in V8, the optimizing compiler is called Crankshaft. It was added in 2010. In Microsoft's Chakra, they call it a full just-in-time compiler. A Squirrelfish doesn't have one, but actually two extra optimizing compilers, a D DFG, Direct Flow Graph, and an FTL just-in-time compiler. So FTL, it's not faster than light, it's fourth tier LLVM. <laughs> and SpiderMonkey has his monkey friend Iron Monkey, which got added in 2013. Okay. So, and to get a little more speed up, what a lot of compilers are doing, they're leaving out the step of translating into bytecode. Um, if you have a fairly naive just-in-time compiler, it doesn't make a big difference time-wise whether you translate into bytecode or whether you translate into machine code. So you can leave out this step and save a little more time. Okay, let's go back to our wonderful twice example. So twice of A gives A plus A. I have the polymorphic and the monomorphic version of it. And now I'm running this with the option minus minus crankshaft. So crankshaft was the optimizing compiler. Um, in reality, crankshaft is the default option. I was running the previous examples specifically without crankshaft. So this is the fast version, which is standard at the moment. Let's look at how this did. So we went from six and five seconds down to 1.3 and 90 milliseconds. Like this is a lot faster than the, the monomorphic version here is really a lot faster than the polymorphic version. This is where you really see a speed up when you go through the trouble of making sure you only use your functions monomorphically. So monomorphic is really better than polymorphic. Okay. And, um, in D8, the debugging shell for V8, you can actually really nicely see what's going on when is the optimizing compiler being called. So when we call this on the slower example with minus minus trace optimization, we see that it is never optimizing the twice function. So you have a few optimizing here, but those are for the random function that I'm using and the main loop. Now if we take the faster example, the monomorphic example, Trace optimization gives you, well, we're optimizing twice string and we're optimizing twice integer. So after the while, the slow compiler says, oh, I'm running those two functions all the time and I'm always running them with the same hidden class. Optimizing compiler, you take over and do a better job and be faster. Um, here's another example. I'm adding two integers or strings again. But this time I'm doing it a million times just for an integer, and only every 10,000 steps I'm calling it once with a string. So if we look at the, the output of this one with trace de-optimization, the first thing we see is we are optimizing twice, because 10,000 times we're calling it with an integer. So it's a hot function, always the same, we can optimize it. But then we come to the 10,000 step and we're calling it with a string, and the compiler is like, de-optimizing. It can't use the optimized version as soon as you change the hidden class. So it's de-optimizing it and it's removing the code it already generated for that. Okay, so as I said, monomorphic is better than polymorphic. Try to not switch it up in between or you lose your optimized code or it might not even ever get optimized. Okay, sadly there are a few more things that the compilers just can't optimize. So anything with a try catch in it, or an eval, or a with, or a switch statement with more than 128 cases. <laughs> also, in your four in loops, make sure you keep your keys local. Don't forget the var, otherwise it can't be optimized. And don't leak arguments or assign to them. So especially V8 is like, nope, not doing that. 
So let's see an example because it seems so silly. I want to compute the Fibonacci numbers. Um, the Fibonacci series is 1, 1, and then every next number you get by adding the last two numbers together. So a very simple recursive algorithm. And for some reason, there is an eval 2 plus 2 hanging out here. It's after the return statement. We'll never get to this point. Okay, but if we run this and we trace the optimization, the compiler is just like, nope, there's somewhere in eval, even though it's after the return statement, not optimizing. And we need to wait uh, over four seconds. So let's go ahead and fix this, delete this line, or comment it out. Run again, and yes, it's optimizing the function Fibonacci, and it's 200 milliseconds. So four seconds versus 200 milliseconds for deleting a line that was never called. Um, here's the actual times, more than 20 times faster just by deleting this extra line. So you know you shouldn't use eval anyways because of maintainability and so on, but even if you say, oh, my code is bug-free and I'll never add a feature, it'll slow you down a lot. Remember this one? Before you optimize, make sure you optimize the right thing. Let's look at our Fibonacci function again. For every n, we are calculating Fibonacci of n minus 1 and n minus 2. So every time we increase n by 1, we double the work that we have to do. So we have exponential complexity 2 to the n. But we can really easily fix that. Uh, minor tweak in the algorithm, just put in a cache the results that you have and use them instead of reworking the, the whole recursion loop every single time. So when we do this, we have linear complexity. Let's see how they compare. So on the left, you have exponential with the compiler-optimized version. We took out eval, and it took 180 milliseconds. On the right, you have the linear algorithm, the better algorithm. I didn't even bother to take out eval, so this not being optimized by the compiler, but it's much faster. So by picking the right algorithm, we're still getting a way better speed up than by optimizing for the compiler. So to summarize, JavaScript nowadays is almost as fast as native C++ code. And that's really amazing, because if you think about it, JavaScript is dynamically typed. We don't know ahead of time, or the compiler doesn't know ahead of time what will happen, so how can it optimize it? And what it relies on heavily are hidden classes and inline caching. Um, and so the way the engines are written, they work best if your application is basically static in nature. So yes, it's still a dynamically typed language, but if you do initializations in the constructor, do not change the type of elements in your array, and especially use monomorphic functions instead of polymorphic functions, you can benefit from all the speed up. So thank you very much. If you have questions, I look forward to answering them at the coffee bar.